time, we're going to invite our panelists to come up. Uh, anyone who has questions, start to prepare them. I'm going to come through the crowd and ask them. Uh, we have a, a great array, array of panelists. We have, obviously, you heard from John Medved, who is here, who's going to come up, um, and Nadav Kidron, who's going to join us. We have J.J. Sussman here, who's a former, inve former investment banker. He's a partner at Lemon Tree Associate, and he's actually a YU alumni. We have Neely Shalev, who came from the Israeli Economic Minister to North America, is here. And we have Avram Av 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 Metzger, who is an investment management tax partner here at PwC. So we invite you up into the, uh, into the panels. For those that have questions, get ready, and we'll come straight to you, or I can have my own questions if you guys don't have, which I'm sure many of you do. Uh, I went to YU, I graduated from YU in 1997. I was just working actually to Dove Adler. I don't know if he's still here. It does. Yeah, and I think about 16 years ago, together we went interviewing uh, at all the accounting firms, got those free lunches. They were great. And uh, together we both got offers to work, I think, at Pricewaterhouse, Coopers, the big six at the time. How many are left? Two or three? And uh, at the time he decided to uh, go on the track to become a partner now. Very. So we're all very proud of him, and I love this at uh, Pricewaterhouse Coopers here as a partner. And I decided at the time to move to Israel. So I moved straight to Israel in 1997. I've been in the high-tech uh, market there for the last 15 years as an investment banker. I also worked at some of the companies that John mentioned, that M Systems and Sandus, where they invented that USB flash drive for about five years in the business development role. And most recently, I've uh, started my own uh, consulting firm, helping Israeli startups to raise capital and. Uh, and helping them uh, strategize on uh, business development and marketing. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, my name is Nili Shalev. Excuse me for my voice. I'm a little bit uh, sick today. Uh, I represent the Israeli government. I'm here the economic minister to North America, work in the Ministry of Industry and Trade, have been in, a, in the ministry for a long time with a short episode also in the private market and uh, have seen or experienced the startup nation revolution from the government perspective. And I think that one slide missing, and maybe you have it and you haven't shown beautiful presentations, and uh, is, is the role of the government in all, in supporting this revolution, which was uh, quite, yeah, it was a big part, and I'm happy to share this information later. Thank you. I'm Aver Metzger. I'm a tax partner here in New York in the asset or investment management group. I work with our Israeli firm uh, in doing tax compliance and consulting for venture capital investments into Israel. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Mark Rosenbaum, who uh, is a PwC US partner who's actually uh, living in Israel and working on our office there, who is involved in uh, bringing companies public, which is why he couldn't be here today. So, Thank you all for joining us. Questions? We had one in the back. Yeah. Loud. Stand. Thanks. Mike. Hold on, I'm, we're going to Oprah this now. We're going to Oprah. Mr. Medved had mentioned that there were companies such as Shopping.com that are based in the U.S. and in Israel, have divisions in both countries. And uh, I guess my question is really about what the government policy is and, and what the government's uh, interests are when it comes to creating the tax policies for these companies and when it comes to uh, consulting firms like PwC, what their interest is and how they represent their clients' interests when it comes to uh, transfer pricing for these types of uh, situations. Wow. How's that for a first <laughs> question? Welcome to New York. <laughs> I'm going to let uh, Neely talk about transfer pricing. <laughs> Um, one of the data points I didn't mention is that today fully half of our high-tech workforce in Israel is working for those multinationals. And that's an extraordinary, I think, achievement. Again, there's a su subject of some discussion and controversy. Some people think it's an outrage that half of our workforce is now working for overseas companies. And I view that the balance between 50% working for Israeli companies and 50% working for Israeli branches of multinationals is a, is a very, very healthy balance you know, for the overall uh, economy. No Israeli company ever grows up in dreams of conquering the Israeli market. That's a huge difference between an Israeli startup and an American startup. American startups 
don't go global from day one. We must. If you don't go global, you don't go anywhere. And so what happens is that literally all of these companies are setting up offices and operations here in America, creating American jobs, hiring American managers, and that's just the way we are. Today, more and more are actually doing similar kinds of activities in, in Asia because there's lots of market and huge trade going you know, on with uh, Asia and, and Israel, and even increasingly with the Arab world. One of the untold stories about Israel is that about um, for the last several years, our trade with our Arab neighbors is going up by about 20% year on year. And uh, if you go you know, on the plane from Tel Aviv to Amman and then on to Dubai, you'll see a bunch of guys with yarmulkes and beards all of a sudden take off the yarmulke and put on a baseball cap, and they're not fooling anybody. <laughs> okay, but um, anyway. Yeah. Maybe I'll just uh, add from the government's perspective. It's uh, uh, as long as we are here to promote and, uh, and, and uh, have more jobs in Israel, but I totally agree with, John, with what John said. A an Israeli company can't grow without being in the market, basically, and to be in the market, it has to expand in the market, and if it will expand in the market, it will expand also in Israel. And as for China, as, and for example, the Israeli government now put a program together to basically give grants to Israeli companies that open subsidiaries in China and hire Chinese people. So it, it's, it's a long way to, for the government to support such initiatives in order to push these companies to penetrate the, the Chinese market. So transfer prices, maybe I'm the tax partner. <laughs> The transfer pricing is definitely a huge part of our practice. I think the fact that the Israeli companies are going global uh, makes the Israeli practice uh, surprising to me when I first started looking into it. Very sophisticated, very high level. They're all working uh, on the same kinds of things that we're doing here basically in the U.S. Uh, we have probably 30 percent of our practice, of our audit practice in our Israeli office is working on U.S. Uh, SEC reporting companies. We have a very substantial U.S. tax practice, uh, and we have uh, there are Israeli PwC people that are sent around the world in order to learn the laws in other countries, make, uh, gain contacts. So it's not just transfer pricing; it's all sorts of different consulting and other planning techniques that uh, and, and arrangements that um, that we get involved with. No one's following that question. Anybody? Someone? Yeah. Um, as, as students, um, we're all trying to figure out our next stage. Um, many of us looking towards Israel, whether it's working for an accounting firm in Israel or going the more entrepreneurial path. Uh, what would you uh, suggest as, our, as the next best step once we graduate, how to get into each one of your fields and, and to follow in your steps? Just do it. I think that's the uh, bottom line. I, I was in this seat 15 years ago, and like I said, I was on the accounting track and probably could have the very exciting life of a partner at one of the big accounting firms, but decided to get on the plane and just move to Israel and just uh, do it. It's very, it's very, you know, the story is incredible, but you get to know the people very quickly. The networking is tremendous. I mean, there are 3,000 YU alumni in Israel, so there's a good head start for everyone in this room. And I think... It's, uh, an, it's enough that you know JJ that you know half of Israel. So that's a good start. <laughs> Happy to help. To give you Nadav, Kidron at gmail.com. And uh, the bottom line is you really just come. Many of us have done it. 3,000 YU alumni have already done it. And uh, if really that's what interests you, and, and it should, you should definitely just do it. And I think even beyond coming to Israel, there's so many opportunities today being here in New York to either invest in Israeli companies through vehicles like, like John's, to learn about Israeli companies, to intern at Israeli companies, to download the apps of Israeli companies like Waze or, or, or others, and to really become a part of it and learn about it before you come there. So. Bottom line is just, as somebody famous once said, just do it. I think if you're not looking to come right away, right out of school, the important thing is to plan. But you should be. <laughs> Which you should be. But you should plan ahead, so you should focus on industries that Israel is, is specializes in, tech and bio, and um, uh, make sure that you're, you're, make, you're developing connections in those areas, that maybe you're working in companies that have connections with Israel, because it's going to become harder to just come, to just leave here and go there, I think, if you don't go right away. I think you're going to need to have some connections with people 
Uh, the more that people know you, the more that you have some reason that people would look to hire you because of your past experiences, I think the more successful you'll be. Just to compound that, there are two other alumni who worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers who are already in here right now. Mark Rosenbaum, we mentioned one of them, worked in the firm here for seven years, worked with Israeli companies, and really paved the path for himself as now a very successful accountant in the PwC Israel office. And Jason Schwartz, who's now, I think, the president of YU Alumni in Israel. Many of you may know him. He was an accountant here in PwC. He was plucked out by John's firm, where I worked together at the time at Israel Seed Partners, to become the CFO of Shopping.com, or the VP of Finance. He's gone on now to work at three other companies as the CFO, and he's exited three times already. He's on to his fourth company, probably a good horse to bet on for another exit. But these are people who have done different paths. Not everyone came right after school. People have, have gotten real experience and become valuable to their Israeli employers. So there's certainly paths to take. I can only give you one advice. You know, sometimes I get an email with a resume from an American student, and they're like, next August, uh, in like eight months, we're coming to Israel. We would like to meet up and have a potential job, and I'm sitting at my desk next August. Who knows where I'll be, what's going to be? You know, it's such a big difference in mentality. Israelis, we plan long term, so we know what's going, what we'll be doing next week. Americans, they plan long term. You know, someone invites me to their birthday two years uh, in advance. So you have to understand, if you're coming to Israel, you have to adjust to the Israeli mentality. Come over to Israel, give them a call, say, guys, I'm here, where can I meet you tomorrow, today, and that's how you do it. Just, just one comment about the age issue. I totally agree with JJ. Come early. I, I got to Israel when I was 22, and uh, that's, that's the best. But Three years ago. Yeah, I, in my mind. Um, but if you don't, it doesn't mean it's too late. My, my late father came to Israel at age uh, 65, after he had sold a, a company we had worked in. And um, I remember the guy from Amoco, the oil company, said, well, Dave, what are you going to do in Israel? Are you going to go live on some kibbutz? Well, my father, within a year of coming to Israel, was so energized that he started another company. He, he taught himself Hebrew, and that was the most successful company that he, he did, uh, thank God, uh, called the, it was, it was called the, optical communications and it was a you know just optical access it was a very very exciting company and so at age 65 he started a new company in Israel and I've seen you know people come in their 60s my mother-in-law came in her 60s to live in Israel and uh, so it, it's it's not something just for 22 year olds you can do it at any age but the, the attitude is just do it you know I think that's absolutely well said and maybe also remember that you bring value First of all, English is a value <laughs> still in Israel, I think. And, uh, and also the connections and the know-how and the methodology that you've learned here in university and others, these are things that I think worthwhile sharing with the Israelis, which learn differently and, uh, and manage differently. And this is uh, come with confidence. Anyone? Yeah. Come with you. Uh, my question is not Israel specific, but I was wondering if the panelists could give us maybe a few tips about the first step or steps to go about raising venture capital for new business. I'll take a swing at that. Um, never send a business plan in over the transom. Never make a cold call to a VC. In other words, if you want to get funding, do a little homework first and figure out who is the right VC for you, because venture capital funds or angels, and it's usually, by the way, for your first funding, more appropriate work on angels, we'll talk about that in a second. But basically, do some mapping and strategy before you go out there. If you think that when they go to a website and it says, send us your business plan, and you send the business plan, something's gonna happen to it, think again, okay? In other words, you've gotta get an introduction to somebody there. And if you can't figure out a way to get an introduction to a partner in one of these firms, then frankly, I'm not really impressed with your chances of success in the, in the business world. So find a way. And how do you get introduced? You start with your own circle, right? In other words, we're all on LinkedIn, you know, we're on Facebook. You can figure out how to meet somebody, you know, through a friend of a friend of a friend. And if you can't do that, then I've got questions about how you're going to be at promoting and building your business. The best kind of early funding is angel funding, in my opinion, okay? Because this is basically friends and family. Never try to get someone to give you money before you've taken that first step of starting yourself. The worst kind of a deal, in my opinion, is that guy who says, look, I got a job, but 
but I'm not quitting my job until I get funding. Okay, I'm not going to take the risk myself. You put the money in, and then I'll start my company. He's out of there, gone. Okay, and so you've got to take the risk, and you've got to be able to show um, typically the investor that you're both building a team, and you've got other people to take risk with you, okay, either on your board or, or together with you, as well as you're making traction, and the thing is starting to happen on its own even before the money goes in. Can, can I just, as you're speaking, can I just sort of crystallize? I think one point that I was thinking of, if you can just maybe comment or people can jump in on this to follow up on your point, is as you were presenting, I was asking myself, what is the trait? And you kept on saying, JJ, just get here. And people, there's a sense of just go do it. And I think, and if I can just ask, it's this mentality of chutzpah, which is people that will ask for things are going to get things. And if you don't have the chutzpah to ask, then you're not in the right business of entrepreneurialism because you just no one's going to hand you a check and say, we saw you somewhere. And the ability to sort of, at some point, maybe get on a plane when you don't know what's going on or make it a, an appointment with someone when you're actually standing in front of their office as opposed to you know, a week in advance or even making sure that when you get into a partner's office, you know everything about them and you got there. Really, is that what's driving this in terms of how you get what you got, where you got to go? Professor Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winner, um, has defined entrepreneurship as a delusional activity. Okay, why is it delusional? It's because basically the odds are against you, right? If you actually look at the statistics, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But he also found something also very interesting in his studies. He found that mass delusion creates its own success. And so, for example, baseball or football teams that actually believe they're gonna win, win better than those who don't believe they're gonna win. So somehow, as a Jewish people, we've always been delusional. Okay, we've always believed in, 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 in the Mashiach, in Tikkun Olam, in, in our purpose in life, in our survival. And you know, from our, our beginning, we, we dream. Okay, we, we see things that other people don't see. And part of this being delusional is that you don't look at this calculation of Oh my gosh, uh, you know, 70% of, of startups are going to fail, and that's, you know, not the, the, the way that entrepreneurs roll. That, that might be why there are no Wilsons and Smiths and Jones, but there are Zuckerbergs and Brins and, and other Jewish founders, even in Silicon Valley, of uh, some of these great successes. Questions? Follow ups? Um, I'll stand close. Um, economy and other fields. So I'm trying to understand where the balance is. Are they ahead in technology but behind? Like, why are they open to learning as opposed to teaching? Are they ahead in technology but behind in everything else? Um, let me see if I understand what you're saying. Um, you, uh, Neely, you, 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 First of all, let me see if I understand. Okay. I, I, I think, look, I, I, what I was trying to say is that um, we realize that we have to partner globally at all times. That not everybody was created equal, that not everybody was maybe created equal with potential, but people have different skills and different abilities. And if you're going to go build a global company, which we have to do, you need to partner with other people who do other things Israelis don't plan. I think what Nadav said, you know, we are, we are not the strongest planning people on the planet. Probably the strongest improvisational people, maybe the people who think best out of the box and on our feet, okay, but we don't plan very well. So if you want to build a big company, sometimes you got to plan, okay, and it's good to have other people around you who have those kinds of skills. Can I jump in with a question? Please, anyway. No, I just want to say, to, it's not that all the Chochmah is in Israel. But I think Israel creates a lot of value also to international companies and multinational companies by bringing more innovative, as we say, innovative spirit. So it's not just, it's the innovation, but also the attitude. And this is what creates also, this is why we see so many multinational companies coming to Israel, not necessarily to learn about the next, the future trends of technology, but to interact with the people that can uh, take them there. 
So this is what, at least what we heard from a few uh, American companies that came to Israel. They haven't necessarily seen the most cutting edge technologies, I must be honest here, but they said that the type of people that they met in Israel is where they want their next R&D center to be because they understand that these are the people that can take them forward. So it's, uh, it's a combination. I hope I answered your question because I'm, I'm not sure I understood it totally. Um, just one comment about productivity. Uh, one of the companies that I helped start with Warwick Pincus is my firm, uh, was Nest Technologies uh, 1999 in Israel, became a global IT services uh, organization with uh, thousands of people, uh, including India, the United States, the Czech Republic, Romania, you name it, and of course Israel. And it turns out when we analyzed uh, the productivity of the engineering staff in Israel in product development, not necessarily in services, I would say it was about 2x on the average, uh, compared to the productivity of uh, st uh, equivalent staff uh, in other countries, and even in the United States. And the reason is the productivity was very high. Uh, uh, for one thing, the level of education is, is very high. I mean, graduates of Tel Aviv and Sheva and so forth and so on are really world class. My grandson is at uh, a... Um, a major in computer engineering at Hebrew U, and it's a good thing I don't have to take his test because I'm not sure I would pass the physics part, although I'm a physicist. But, but seriously, the, uh, the productivity is very high, and this is really reflected in the ability of Israeli companies to get products to market very quickly, and there's been a great competitive advantage. Uh, one of the comparisons that's often made is that India is a powerhouse for IT technology, don't believe a word of it. Do not believe it. Uh, the average engineering quality is very low. There are, of course, very, very good people. Uh, but for creative software development, uh, that's not a place that you necessarily want to go. Whereas Israel is where you go. And this is why the, the multinationals are in Israel. And this is a great advantage, which is, I think, a result of both culture and the fact that the best schools are very, very good and extremely demanding. Can I ask a follow-up to what you were saying before, before we turn it back? The, the question that I had as you were speaking about uh, chutzniks and, and people in Israel, is there anything someone could do to involve themselves in the Israeli economy without actually living in Israel? Is there what we can do in America if I, for I guess JJ's, for the wrong reasons, let's say, I'm living in, 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 uh, in, in America, and I'm not planning on moving, let's well, say. Well, at least I see I'm a little bit successful. You're already feeling guilty that you're here. <laughs> And I'm not planning on, let's say, not me personally, I'm speaking at the proverbial eye. And I am not planning on moving anytime soon. However, I am swept up in this presentation, blown away. And I want nothing more than to involve my career with that of Israel. What can we do from America as we plan our careers or we're mid our careers to get involved in this? Well, I think we're at a business school event here, right? So I can speak a little bit about business. I think uh, oftentimes we talk about Israeli innovation and how incredible the technologies are. And Nadav shows some incredible real inventions that, that took place in Israel. I think oftentimes we neglect to really focus that with the other part of the puzzle, which is the financial markets, which have had a tremendous effect. I mean, Neely was talking about the government involvement in setting up the, the whole venture capital industry through Yozma, which, add, you know, which aided a tremendous foreign investment to, uh, to the Israeli startup scene which created a lot of business for the, Israeli invest for the American investment banks to come and take companies public. The 80 mergers and acquisitions that happen every year uh, enable work for bankers who graduated the Sysum School of Business and now working at Goldman Sachs to do business in Israel. So besides just the financial part of it, which is, I think, a tremendous part, working in accounting with Israeli companies, also on the technology companies. They're, all Israeli technology companies have U.S. presence. A company I'm working with now, uh, LiveView, has offices in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Anybody who wants to work there and, and bring their business development acumen, I'm sure they can get involved and work for an Israeli company here in Israel. And again, the, the innovations that take place, Waze or, or Jiffity, another small company we were just talking about earlier, has a new app that's about to launch. And if you want to get involved in the Israeli you know, startup nation or, or revolution that's really taking place, the avenues are all over the place and you just got to pick one and, and really jump in. Even if you're living here, for the wrong reasons. I want to ask, how many are even thinking about 
moving to Israel one of these days. Thinking about it. Wow. That's impressive. It's a good place. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say a, a quick thing. I, I think a, part of the big answer to it is awareness. Uh, you know, if you're aware of it and you think about it the same way, you know, it says in the Rambam, but if you go and you buy something, you, you may as well buy it from your, your fellow uh, achicha, right? So same thing here. So many of the activities that we do, if we're even going to be aware and we think, you know what, let's do something with Israel, it can already make a big difference. And as JJ mentioned, many of the Israelis can speak English, but they don't speak American. The advantage of you guys, that you grew up here, is you understand not only how to speak English, it's how to speak American. I remember when I did, started doing business here, I would come out of a meeting and someone would ask me, how did the meeting go? I said, I have no idea. I said, those Americans are so polite. They tell you, they smile at you, they say, thank you very much. It was lovely meeting you. I have no idea what do they think and what do they mean. And I had an American next to me and they will translate the American into English so I can understand what it is they're saying. But what that mean is, means is that you have a huge advantage coming to Israel or staying here and working with Israeli companies and never forget that. Just a couple of quick points, because I think there's a, a, a great question. First of all, help spread this story. Okay, this story is dynamite, okay, relative to Israel's image. All we hear about... That was JJ from Good Times, by the way. <laughs> That's JJ. Um, I mean, there's so much, you know, stuff we hear about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions. This is the, not the antidote, this is the vaccine, okay? And if we can get this story out, starting with the Jewish community, which doesn't yet really know it, okay? How many federations have tech divisions are sitting and really working on bringing the tech Jews into our tent? So th that's number one. Number two is you guys got to get educated. There are three daily papers online in English about Israeli business, which you can read, okay? Globes, the Calculist, and the Marker, okay? You got to read that stuff. You got to read those websites. You got to get educated, learn the companies, learn the, the players, okay? Calculist, the Calculist, the, you know, our, our version of The Economist. Um, on top of that, each and every one of you should get used to buying Israeli stocks, okay? There are so many of them traded. If you're not doing it on your own, then buy a mutual fund or get involved. But get involved in terms of buying Israeli equities and get involved in investing in Israel. Work for Israeli companies if you can. And if you're not a company or business person, then find your Israeli counterpart to interact with. Teachers can interact with other teachers, and social workers can interact with other social workers, and everybody can find their partner in Israel. If you can't come and live in Israel for good, you come for a summer and you work, or you bring your family for a year for sabbatical. It has a huge impact. And I think they're just a whole series of these elements, but the most important one is to get this story out there so people can begin to understand that Israel is a lot different than just the conflict. Just to follow up on this one point, for those that are here, just so you know, that this is part of what we're doing at Sims, at Sci Sims, And so post this event, you can go to the website. We're going to have a lot of what, what we're saying just now on the website. We'll have these presentations. We'll have ways to get involved. So if you actually are really interested, if you're real about it and you really want to get involved, you don't have to say, oh my gosh, I forgot what he said. I can't. Everything's going to be on the Sim site, and we'll be doing more programs with the panelists here. We have still a few more questions. We're not done yet. Just a few more minutes. But I want to make sure you know that come to us, because we're going to give you the resources to get where you got to go. I just wanted to follow up on Charlie's point. Um, in terms of entrepreneurship, one of the things that you're doing is you're using things and tools that you have to further your pursuits and your ideas. Um, when I joined my law firm before I, I was at Yeshiva University, I came in and saw a bunch of partners killing each other over business within Manhattan and the United States. And one of the things that I did was I realized, you know what, I have a lot of friends and uh, re relationships in Israel. And I started uh, and started to co-lead the Israel practice at my law firm. And what I found was was it didn't take long to find a colleague or a friend that had made Aliyah or a relationship that I had in Israel. 
And I went over to Israel, and before I knew it, I was representing many of the companies and working with many of the companies that John uh, and Nadav had mentioned. So you have the relationship. You have the network of Yeshiva University. You have relationships within the community and relationships with, because you're, you're Zionistic and you, you know a lot of people in Israel. And you should use that as well. If you're not going to go there, use that to your advantage as you build your businesses and your professions here in America. I just wanted to add, we, ha we did a survey at the Israeli Economic Mission and we found out 600 Israeli and Israeli-related companies in the East Coast. You, it's easy to assume that most of them are in New York. New York has a huge number of Israeli companies, startup companies that are coming here. Very easy. There are many forums also that you can attend and participate, newsletters, uh, events that you can see Israeli startup companies and just get used to... Uh, to what in what areas they're active, what they're showing, what, how they're presenting, and and relate to them, and this will make you, you know, closer to the community that also invests in them. So there is a lot of information over there, and I'll be happy to share. I have one specific idea, which I, should, I can't hold back. You guys at YU should set up a testing lab for social and consumer applications. You're listening to mine and Charlie's conversation at dinner. No, I didn't. We were talking about that. But that basically what's happened is there's this massive shift in the Israeli sort of tech scene. to Everybody's doing social something or consumer-oriented end-user applications. And they sit in Israel and they do a pretty good job of figuring out what consumers are thinking. But to be able to use a friendly audience before it gets out there and gets viral. And I could think of no better place than why you or people could play with this stuff and come back and say, this UI needs to be fixed, or this feature is not a good idea, or you're missing the American head. And I'm, I'm sure that whether it's you know, through the, the, the government office or through, uh, Professor Harari and others, if, if you actually did this, it would be an amazing thing and, and very useful. So we, we thank John for, uh, for that, the, 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 the pitch, because what's happening, this is actually one of the things that we're incubating right now. So for those that want to get involved in this, we're going to, in the next few months, be able to roll this out, to have this lab of sorts with NYU, to be able to play this role, to have this inter inter interaction. And so um, if you're interested in things like this, you know, we'll, you'll be hearing more from us. But stay close, alumni and current students. Stay close because this, this is coming down the pike. Um, I happen to be an investor uh, in a number of oil and gas stocks in Israel. And you mentioned uh, to invest in Israel. The hassles and unfriendliness dealing with the Israeli banks is just impossible. Uh, is there anyone here who can, I know there's no one here from Discount, Lumi, or any other bank, but I'm honestly telling you, they're just impossible to deal with. I think that one is coming. Just, you think I that just, one is can coming? we have a member of the government here? Uh, 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 softballs. I can only say that I've heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I heard it before. First of all, there are Israeli companies traded here uh, in NASDAQ, Nadav's company. They're not oil and gas, but uh, maybe some oil and gas in, in, in NYSE. And, uh, um, but, but we've heard it before. There was, uh, from the Ministry of Finance, we have some senior people here, Odette Sarig, the um, head of the capital market in, in the Ministry of Finance. And uh, many people conveyed this uh, fact that you just raised. And um, I can try and follow up and see uh, what can be done with it. But uh, it's, um, I know that they, they are aware of, this pro of the problem. Thank you very much. I want you to also know that I report any tax profits or loss to the US government over here. <laughs> but the hassles against the <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, if, 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 you would, if you invested early enough, it's probably worth the hassle. <laughs> okay, we have one, two more comments. We're going we're gonna to do two more here. You, just, you know, we're going to have one comment here and then two, and then we're, we're going to conclude. So just a few more minutes, and we'll be done. Thank you. I just have a comment that there's a program. Uh, I'm an attorney in an Israeli-U.S. law firm, and there's a program. I think it's the Jewish Agency, if I'm not mistaken, for uh, training, like summer internship or something like this, for free, I think for, uh, of course it's for free, the Israelis don't pay, but basically for Americans to come to Israel for a few months and work. For example, my law firm in Israel, I know we had a few, uh, few interns like this coming from law schools here to work for a few months, and I think the Jewish agency promotes that. It's like the equivalent of... Um, how do you call them, a sa? Sa. Yeah, exactly. So I think it should be And, and then, by the way, there's a new one for just the summer called Onward Israel, 
and I'll tell you that um, after one of my speeches at Santa Cruz, the head of the Santa Cruz pro-Israel organization happens to be a Korean non-Jewish guy who was brilliant, and he wrote me and said, can I come and intern in your company for the summer? And he was so good, that he's now gonna, as soon as he's graduating, coming back, God willing, to, uh, uh, you know, to work with us. But th these internship programs are amazing, and if you haven't done them, I would urge you to consider it. It's a great way to test the waters and you know, work with an Israeli company. Um, one of the things that was said here tonight was the extent to which we should get involved, and, and obviously it's an amazing audience. When you think about the YU network, and that it starts at a pretty young age, we start to, to deal with our kids in high school, it would seem to me, if it makes any sense, that there's an opportunity to incorporate some kind of Israeli business course right through the high school years in order to understand the culture. It's a very different culture. To your point, you don't make an appointment even two days in advance. You kind of call an hour before when you're kind of, you know, Kfish Tel Aviv Yerushalayim to get there. So I wonder what your thinking is on that. Does it make sense to start this at that young an age? And is this some, if, if it makes sense, it feels very opportunistic for YU to separate itself from other options, even at the high school level? I was working to, uh, as, I guess as the only YU alumnus, except for all of them there, on the panel, that had, had an event like this existed when I was in YU, I would have asked for it every single week. I mean, it's something that I don't know why it hasn't happened until now. I think we can only thank the organizers of tonight's event that they finally uh, woke up and decided to run events like this. I mean, it's a combination of Israel and technology excitement and awesomeness, guys like John Redven and his Hawaiian shirts. I mean, these events can happen all the time, high school, college, and the network in Israel is tremendous. People are there all the time. I mean, on, on Sukkot just now, you walk around the streets of Yerushalayim, it seems like, uh, you know, Morgan Rubin are, are in the King David and the uh, in Baal. It, there's no reason why it shouldn't happen, and, and we can only thank Charlie and, and the entire team here for starting it tonight and hope that it continues. I'm thinking, though, even younger. And my question is, does that seem salient? I mean, I'm sure John in a Hawaiian shirt would be terrific for that. <laughs> I, I don't see why not. I mean, John had a slide up there where the entrepreneurs, they never saw you in a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> he had a slide up there where the entrepreneurs are uh, 15 and 20 years old. Uh, and we, we get all, emails all the time, guys starting up businesses at these crazy young ages, mostly because they know how to use these technologies that, you know, even I don't know how to use. But uh, there's no reason why not. Look, I, I think this is actually a very serious issue. The, the, the whole question of how you teach entrepreneurship and encourage it and create heroes for, for younger people that are not, you know, rock stars right. or sports figures. Positive role models. Okay, and um, is, is important not just for the Jewish community but outside of it. And um, I know there are efforts afoot in Israel. First of all, we have to teach it in Israel. Okay, in other words, what's funny about this whole story is that in Israel, a lot of people view this as political propaganda. In other words, they look at this and they say, well, it's okay, you know, they'll, they'll basically, you know, that somehow by being proud of our achievements, that's already, you know, an amira politi, that's like a, you know, political statement. And it's amazing how many Israelis don't know this stuff and how important it is for us to, you know, work with our young people, both, you know, uh, at all ages in terms of dreaming. Now, it turns out that in Israel, there are lots of competitions for sort of like, the, you know, it's, it's like uh, uh, um, American Idol for entrepreneurs. And my daughter, for example, who went to a, you know, quite a religious high school called uh, Chorev. Uh, the Chorev girls were always basically competing and winning these entrepreneurial contests, you know, in, in the country. And there are literally about a dozen of them that get kids at age 13 and 14 to create their own companies, to design stuff. I mean, she basically was told to make a project that would be a company that would save people's lives. And they came up with this thing about how to avoid leaving your kid in a car seat, which I thought was spectacular, but her group only came in second nationwide. And of course, like any Jewish parent, I said, well, who beat you? Okay, and how do you, that's a great idea. Okay, it was so good, by the way, when I talked about this once, a, a, a lady from uh, Procter & Gamble wanted to license it. We found out that NASA already had the patents. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is that, that the people who, who, who beat her were a group of 15-year-old boys who had invented a non-spillable cholent pot, which was so, that was so, that was so uh, you know, powerful 
that they already had racked up like $30,000 of sales in Maya Sharim, okay, which is not easy to get a dollar out of Maya Sharim, that's for sure. Okay, and, but the, uh, this kind of stuff is important. But so it's not just talking about it, it's living it, it's doing it, it's giving the kids a challenge, and that's important. Last question. Hi, thanks for the uh, presentations. They're all uh, really excellent. The first presentation, you sort of see that, and you say, that's great. That's a lot of excellence in there. Um, if you look, Michiel Kvo, the uh, representative from the government, if you look at the political situation in Israel, it's sort of like, eh, like, could we put together that same sort of slideshow? How do you guys see your responsibility towards actually moving that excellence towards the government? And also, how at the whim are you of the next administration, which maybe promotes some sort of social change that actually wipes out some of the progress we've made? First of all, we welcome good people to the government, and uh, also there are roles within the government that are always uh, um, being, oc being occupied by, by people from the business world. So for an example for it is the office of the chief scientist that, in my ministry that is responsible for all R&D grants. The political system in Israel is... Uh, uh, challenging, definitely, but I, I think that what you see recently is more and more people trying to get on board. Getting on board Israeli politics is not easy. And it's a price, that a personal price, that people need to be willing to pay. And uh, everywhere, also in the U.S., maybe it's more civilized here, but uh, everywhere. So getting people, good people uh, from, from the high-tech industry into politics is is a big sacrifice, but you see, Rel Margalit uh, is uh, it's, you know it's it's huge actually. What's yeah. happening now is, and you might not see it here, but we f see it and feel it, is that across the board, regardless of where your politics are, the new sort of bright stars are all, many of them coming from tech. So Rel Margalit is an extraordinarily successful Jerusalem-based uh, uh, rising star in the Labor Party. Okay, happens to be a huge venture capitalist who's got the single largest exit to date in Israel, six billion dollars for Chromatis. Okay, uh, the mayor of Jerusalem today is Nir Barakat, who actually, you know, provided a half million dollars of seed money for what became Checkpoint, which is a got a fourteen billion dollar, uh, you know, market cap. The new leader of the Mafdal of the NRP, which is I think very appropriate here. God willing, we'll know tomorrow when the votes are. I'm, I'm getting home to vote for him, believe it or not is Naftali Bennett, who was a, uh, an entrepreneur who we were lucky enough to invest in. His company, Sayota, was sold for $160 million. He then went and ran Bibi's Lishka when Bibi was in opposition, and he's now running to run the, uh, the Mafdal and put new life there. And he's got 50,000 young people who have signed up you know, to re, you know, uh, revivify the Mafdal. So I see this happening across the board from uh, left to right, and I, I'm very optimistic about it, actually. Also many journalists, yeah. which is a different type of... Uh... Maybe just one more comment about the government. You know, when I grew up in Israel, we always knew the joke about uh, a competition that was made to squeeze a lemon. And this big guy comes, and he takes out the lemon, he squeezes whatever is left in it. And then this other huge guy comes, and he's able to get a little bit more of a drop out of the lemon. And then this skinny guy comes over, he takes the lemon, he squeezes out of it. You don't understand where you take it. Whatever is left, he was able to squeeze out of that lemon. People come over to this guy and they say, how did you do that? He said, I work for the Israeli Masach Nasa, the IRS. <laughs> and we always knew, you know, Masach Nasa, they squeeze you. You don't want to be their friend. You don't want to have anything to do with them. That's where I grew up in Israel. When I started Oramed, people all the time came to me and they said, why aren't you taking money from the government? I said, me, government, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Another year, another year, another year, and people all the time ask me, why don't you go to the chief scientist? Eventually I said, you know what? In Israel, there's also a very important thing to know. One of the most important things, you never want to be a flyer. So I said, there's no way everybody else is taking money from the chief scientist. Let me look into it. I went to the chief scientist, and I was so impressed. They brought someone to look into the science, to check the technology. The money that they spent on the company was so well spent. I said, if all taxpayers' money will be spent just as well as this one, I'm happy to pay my taxes. Don't worry, that's not the case. <laughs> but the point is that it's been really a wonderful experience. And I think today we live in a new era where we can really enjoy government's funding in different ways. OK, well, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate the, thing, the, the presenters. We thank the Sims board. 
For those of you who want to stay involved, we're doing a ton of stuff, so stay close to us whether you've graduated or you're still here. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful night. I hope you enjoyed.